Little Britches. Father and I were ranchers. We're going to read the second part of chapter 16 today. Mother must have mentioned something about wishing we had a cellar half a dozen times while we were packing the barrels of pork away in my room in the bunkhouse. At breakfast the next morning, Father winked at me and said, Do you think we could spare time to go up the canyon for a load of poles today? Of course, I did think so. And right after breakfast, he started putting Bill's harness on the new colt. Then he sent me up to Altland's on Fanny and said to tell Fred we'd like to borrow one to fit her. I was so excited about going to the mountains with Father that I didn't think much about what we were going to do with three harnesses. But Fred did. As soon as I told him what I wanted and where we were going, he scratched his head and said, Has your old man gone loco? If he thinks he's going to harness that green colt and take him up to the mountains along with the rights, old mare, he's either the bravest man I ever seen or a damn fool. I told him father was the bravest man he had ever seen and wasn't any fool. So he let me have the harness. I had to walk Fanny all the way home because the harness slapped around so much when I made her canter. All the way, I kept thinking about what Fred had said. I was kind of scared, too, about what would happen when Father got all three horses hooked up to the wagon. When I got there, he already had old Bill's harness on the colt, but he had it fastened on with three or four extra straps, and the traces were tied up around the back of the breeching. The colt was sweaty and nervous, but he wasn't raising Ned at all. After Father had hooked Nig and Fanny to the box wagon, and Fanny had got over slatting around, he led the colt out and tied him up close to the back of it. He hitched his head to both sides so that he had to keep it right in the middle of the tailgate. Then I ran to the house for our dinner trail, and we started off. You never saw a horse buck and kick much worse than that colt did when he felt the harness flopping around him. But Father had it strapped on so tight and his head tied up so short that he couldn't hurt anything. By the time we went past Altland's house, he was soaking wet, but he wasn't bucking anymore, just dragging back on the halter ropes and trying to spit out the bit. Fred was standing out in the yard when we went past. When I waved at him, he waved back and yelled, I'll take back what I said, Spikes. I just grinned because I knew all the time that whatever Father did would be right. Father must have guessed what Fred had said because I didn't tell him, but he looked over at me and grinned too. When we had loaded our poles and got down out of the canyon, Father tied the colt alongside a nig. That time he fastened a strap from the colt's outside trace over onto Nig's breeching so that he could swing his hind end around sideways. At first, he'd hang back till the single tree bumped against his legs. Then he'd jump around and kick. But Nig didn't care, and then he learned to stay up where he belonged. Father unhitched Fanny after we got home, and while we still had the load of poles on the wagon, he hooked the colt in her place. By that time, he was used to the harness, and I guess he was a little tired, but he hardly made a bobble. In half an hour, he was pulling like an old horse. We hauled poles for three days and took the colt with us every day. After the first one, Father put him in Fanny's place just as soon as we got down out of the canyon, and from then on, he behaved better than Fanny did. Before we started hauling poles, Father had dug a little ditch around a patch of garden in the backyard. He made a trough that ran out there from the well, and every morning and night, it was my job to pump the ditch full of water. In three days, the ground had softened up in good shape, so we borrowed Carl Henry's slip scraper and started digging our cellar. I had learned how to ease a horse up into the collar for a hard pull while we were stacking hay. Father hitched Nig and the new colt to the scraper and let me drive them while he held the handles. If I didn't start the team real easy when Father raised the handles of the scraper, the cutting edge might catch and throw him up under the horse's heels. Father explained it to me before we started and I was so afraid I might do something wrong and get him badly hurt 
that my hands were shaking when I reached out to take the lines. He wouldn't let me take hold of them. He said I'd have to stop a little while and get my mind straightened out because a horse could tell through the feel of the reins if a person driving him was afraid. Then he told me I had already proved I could make a horse do what I wanted it to, so there was no reason to be afraid now. It made me proud to hear him say that, and when I reached out for the lines again, my hands were steady. I wrapped the reins around them and called, get up, with my voice as deep in my throat as I could make it go. We scooped out a hole nearly as big as our kitchen, while Father dug the corners out square with a pick and shovel. I peeled bark off the poles with his draw knife. It took five days to build the cellar. After the hole was dug, we cribbed the walls up with poles like a log house. We made the end walls half round at the top and then laid poles across to make the roof. Grace and I stuffed all the cracks on the outsides of the walls and roof with straw while Father made the door and the steps. Then we hitched up the horse and with the scraper at the end of a long rope, filled dirt in tight around the sides and over the roof till it looked like a little hill with a trap door in it. The next week, I peeled poles while Father built them into a corral. It was a good one with a six-pole fence five feet high. Father set a big high post for the gate to swing on. Then he made the gate out of slim poles with the butt ends toward the hinges and a guy wire running from the top of the posts to the lighter end of the gate so it would never sag. While we were building it, I got thinking how lonesome our little house had looked to me sitting out there on the prairie when I had first seen it from the hill by Fort Logan. When the last nail was driven and the hasp was put on the gate, I got Father to let me put Nig and the new colt and our two cows in the corral. Then he let me take Fanny and ride up that hill again so that I could look at our place and see how much it looked like a real ranch now. And we'll read Chapter 17 next time. Thanks so much for watching. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now. I love you guys. Bye-bye.